I wish the class had never come to me. So do all who live to teach in such times. Okay. All right, Frodo, bring forth the ring and set it on the table. Who will bear this burden to Mordor? I will. It is a heavy burden to bear. You have my sword. And my, uh, my bow. Oh, orcs! Da 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 all right, it's lecture 36 time. We're going to be looking over chapter 38, just this one and one more to go, and then we're all done with the lectures for this course, and then you just have to dread over the final. All right, so transmission line and wave equation. So for this, what do we care about? We're actually looking at this from a physics standpoint now. We're going to start thinking about things from slightly more electromagnetic uh, field theory perspective and less so from a traditional circuit model perspective. That said, let's use a circuit model <laughs> to build a transmission line, okay? And there are many different kinds of transmission lines and physical constructions of a transmission line. And the wave uh, mechanics in there are, are dictated by the field mechanics at play. These are all derived from Maxwell's equations, okay? so. And they're going to give us basically all the all the nitty gritty behaviors that we're going to uh, see here today. They're kind of working behind the scenes here, working behind the scenes. And as this isn't really a physics course, I'm not going to dig into these equations too much, as much as I would love to. But um, what we're going to start seeing here is that we're moving away from our omega notation. Not exactly. You're going to be jumping between all these different things perpetually if you continue in uh, any kind of physics representation of this field. But we're becoming more flexible between lambda, f, and omega here. Okay, And these are all different sides of the same thing. And there's actually a, uh, a little diagram in Wikipedia. I wonder if I can find it here, maybe for the next lecture, but we'll see. Um, that shows the relationship between lambda, f, omega and K, uh, which we're going to talk about later, um, and all these other things that are, that are going on in, in this sort of, in a, in a wave. Okay, so let's dig in. I have a transmission line. There are many ways to construct it. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Okay, I'm going to put in some, some elements in here. And actually, these elements aren't real, okay? These are just models for effects that we observe. So what are those effects? We, we notice that as we go down the line, we encounter um, a kind of resistance, but it's a resistance with respect to the length of the transmission line, okay? So in this case, and this is a very important thing to note here because it, it becomes very important, our R values, our L values, and our C values are no longer just straight up R, L, and C. They're actually R, L, and C with respect to a unit distance. So although it says R here, I'm going to repeat this because none of your other teachers in the future are going to tell you this and it's going to frustrate you to no end, but this R is not equivalent in terms of units to your old versions of R. This is a, this is a measure of R which is per unit length. Okay? All right. Now that we've got that out of the way, I've aired my grievances, let's move on. Similarly, um, there's some kind of magnetic field that we're dealing with when we have these transmission lines, especially for the coax cable. Um, and this is also proportionate to the length of the line. You can imagine, uh, for coax cable, by the way, you know, you have one thing here and another thing here, right? You have your, maybe your positives here and your negatives, your positives inside of this part. Okay, this little region here. 
um, all the way around, and then you're negative, and you can see that there's there's going to be some uh, electromagnetic fields uh, behaving in here as well. So effectively, there's some kind of inductance going on uh, along the length of the transmission line. So we can deal with that later, but for right now, uh, we'll just leave it as is, and we're not going to dig into that part of it. A lot of fun, by the way, looking at this stuff for, the for field theory, if you get the right instructor. Okay, and then we also have some kind of capacitance between the two lines. Uh, you can definitely see that in the coax, okay? It's like, kind of like, oh, hey, there's a positive and there's a negative and they're transmitting information. Now, you may ask yourself, why the hell would we do that? Why would we put our two lines next to each other and and induce all these effects? What the hell is going on? Um, why is a coaxial cable useful? Well, actually, what's really cool about it is that the way in which the fields relate to each other actually help propagate that signal through the length of the transmission line. That's why it works so well. And that's why our cables and stuff are designed the way that they are so that they can transmit inf information with high fidelity and they don't peter out just because of this resistance over here where you just have two lines strung uh, next to each other the entire length of the way. So it helps stabilize us in, in a manner of speaking uh, for the length of the transmission. And so it's very important for us to accommodate that. There's another piece of the puzzle here that I, I want to address, and, and the book actually doesn't put this in here, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's kind of a shame, really. Um, I don't know if I put it in my notes here today. Nope. Oh, there's a terminator. Um, but you also need to account for this other thing, and that's this. Maybe there's some leakage between the two. In the coax, um, yeah, <laughs> definitely true, right? The, you're so close together, of course you could get some kind of uh, leakage through here. Just a little tiny, tiny bit, okay? But it's still possible, um, given whatever medium this is, uh, that you could get some kind of leakage through there. It really just depends. Uh, twisted cable, same thing. Um, you can also just have parallel lines, right? I mean, that's a kind of transmission line. So in the early days of uh, telegraphers, uh, you know, how do you measure a signal that's going across extremely long distances and what's the most efficient way to design a line to transmit that information? Well, uh, as it turns out, there's a lot of different ways and it really depends on what you're sending. Okay, that's the long short of it. Um, but for our purposes today, we're just going to examine this model of the behavior, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about what the coax implications are, but by and large, we're just going to talk about this behavior. Oh, I should probably label this guy. This is going to be equal to G delta, delta Z, okay? And that's going to become important for us moving forward. Okay, so what we're looking at in this model here, in this particular model, is a length, an arbitrarily small length of line. Because recall that everything that we do in any kind of uh, continuous frame of reference is ultimately actually just a discrete in disguise, right? And so what we're doing is we're taking these as, as delta Z gets kind of infinitely small almost, right? And we're assessing, okay, for any kind of arbitrarily small length of, of line, for here's my big long transmission line, What's the effect? And then I can accumulate that effect over the entire length. That's the name of the game here. Okay. Well, some things happen at high frequency. So the Lorentz force is going to push the electrons to the surface of the conductor. Here's the equation for that. Um, and this is going to cause what's called skin effect, where the, the depth of your ability to transmit through this line... Uh, lessens with increasing frequency. So basically, if I have a bunch of charges in here, okay, uh, they can flow through into, right, or out of uh, this this cable that's flowing through your screen right now. Um, and uh, what happens is as the frequency increases, these guys basically can't live in the center anymore. They want to move to the outside. They're kind of pushed by the electromagnetic field to the outside portion of this for the high frequency. And so the effective 
area that they can transport through becomes smaller and smaller. And so you can imagine here that as this decreases and my effective area gets to be very small based on the highness of the frequency, that now I've induced kind of this problem, right? This sort of resistance in the line um, because the wire is just too darn small for everything that I'm trying to push through. So that skin effect is a, is a real, real bugger. Um, but we can, you know, we have models for this. We have ways of working around it, but that's, um, an important note here. Oh, um, another note is that if you're interested in this stuff, you'll want to take a class called vector calculus. So funny story. When I first started here, uh, I guess it was only about two and a, about two years ago now. Um, I started off by taking two courses. I took, um, the electromagnetic field theory and I took the, uh, digital signals processing with Zoltowski with both of them, the graduate versions of the course. Um, Zoltowski was amazing, but the thing with electromagnetic field theory was it was really difficult for most of the other people at first. I had a leg up because as a mathematician, I had taken vector calculus prior. So when we were going over all of these, um, all these vector spaces in these, in these fields that we were dealing with, I had a huge toolbox at my disposal for this. So if you plan on working with, um, f you know, electromagnetic fields in any way in your future, I highly encourage you to take this course. And I think it's actually a graduate course at Purdue, which is fine. If you have taken Calc 3, you are more than equipped for vector calculus. Okay, so I strongly encourage you guys to look into that as one of your math electives, uh, if you so choose, if it's relevant to your discipline. Now, if you're doing computer engineering, um, th this probably won't be useful for you. But if you're doing some true EE stuff um, or dealing with really strong fields, uh, this is a must have and, uh, in, in your toolbox. Um, and I'm probably the only person that'll tell you to do that, but I think it really helped me quite a bit and had some of my compatriots in that electromagnetic field theory taste taking that, you know, course, they, they too would have had a very easy time with some of those problems that they struggled with, uh, later on. So anyways, just for your consideration. All right. So basically what we're going to do is in theory, we're stringing together, um, these infinitesimally small versions of, of this model. And, uh, we're stringing together an infinite number of them. Uh, you know, you can, you can count it depending on how you want to count your Delta Z. If you want it to be discrete, that's fine too. Um, but we have a resistance per unit length that we're looking at, uh, for cumulative effects, chaining them together. Um, we want to use wavelength here to describe our system because, Here's what happens as the wavelength becomes roughly equal to, as it's shrinking down, roughly equal to about 10 times the size of the elements or less, we start to see these uh, effects. So really when we, when we get to a certain high frequency, uh, higher frequency, we start to see these sort of things uh, occur in our transmission line. Hey, look, it's Charmander. Hey, get out of the way. Get out of here. What are you doing? All right, please get out of the way, Charmander. Right, you just sit over here, okay? Why don't you just stay here? All right, so anyway, um, recall the continuity equations. What? Continuity equations? They're evolving. No way. Oh, guys, this is cool. Check this out. Ah, oh, they became the telegrapher's equations. All right. Well, <laughs> that's like the worst gag in the world. Okay. No, come back. I'll just put you in the quarter. All right, Charmeleon, just chill out down here. You can hang. You can hang out here. Um, so, <laughs> anyways, Pokemon aside, um, I don't know how to delete this thing. Here we go. There's too much garbage now on the, on the page. I can't even write anymore. So, looking back at our continuity equations... Notice here that this relates the voltage to the current flowing through, okay? And we're taking a derivative with respect to time. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to add in a extra dimension because we're traveling along the length of wire here, Z. Oh, a quick side note. 
Uh, Z is sometimes, sometimes we use X. Okay, that's just the way it is. Uh, honestly, I think Z makes more sense as a mathematician um, and as an electrical engineer, but sometimes X is going to be used because it's the first uh, dimensional uh, line that you use, but because of reasons related to the field theory and the physics that's going on here, Z really is the best variable to use here because it represents um, the the sort of crossing. If you're looking at this as a cross section of wire, then the cross section already has two inherent uh, dimensional elements to it, which is X and Y, um, and then that cross section gets propagated via Z. Okay, so look. Basically, use Z for this, okay? And if you see X, just replace it with a Z. Uh, it's not a big deal. They just were too lazy to worry about the cross-section. Okay, anyways. So we're going to add that extra uh, dimensional element here, and we're going to call it Z. I'm going to put Z on this thing. So effectively, this is just Charmander with a Z, okay? There we go. He's going he's gonna to get a Z. Um, so the telegraphers' equations are looking at the uh, current and the voltage as they are functions of their distance down the line and of time. So I can look at the voltage and the current anywhere along my line for any position that I might be in, right? And I should probably use a different color than, than what I wrote everything in. For any position that I'm in and any time that I'm in. And that gives us the telegrapher's equations. In the lossless system, where we don't have any of these resistances in there, it's pretty easy to see that at any given point, I can apply my continuity equations, right? And then I just tack in a Z and say, well, yeah, it's the um, wherever I'm at here is actually dependent on um, that voltage uh, that I have. Uh, at a particular point in time. So long story short, these are the telegrapher's equations, uh, and we're going to derive them uh, here from the, the lossy case in a moment, but this is what they are. And for the lossy case, where I have those two uh, resistors in here, in the model, right, it's resistors in the model, I have some kind of um, resistance here and, and allowing some current to pass between the two here. I end up with a equivalent version of the telegrapher's equations. And these are the ones you're going to see more often when you um, start to, you know, uh, faint a little bit in your class and you go, oh, no, <laughs> this is when you know things are going to get real. Um, if you just see these these equations, this is the instructor just be like, eh, well, just, it's good enough. <laughs> it's just a lossless system. We'll just assume it's lossless. And that's the ideal case. So this is ideal here. And this is the non, kind of non-ideal case. Okay. So it's important to note that if someone gives you, including me, uh, a question that says, hey, assume that this is ideally transmitting or whatever, then you'll just use this version of the telegrapher's equations. And if they say non-ideal, then, then you're going to have to, you know, bust out all this garbage down here. Let's go ahead and derive these equations real quick and do them some justice. This is an important page, by the way, so it's got a lot of good equations for you. Okay, so looking at this system for the lossy case, and we can actually just simplify it once we get it done, right? Um, if we look at it from the perspective of voltage, the difference in voltage here, right, between where I start and where I end is just got to be equal to delta Z times, and notice that this coefficient, I just pulled it out from all of these, these two different pieces here, um, R times I. Okay, that's fine. That makes sense. V equals IR. No problem there. Uh, I just have a delta Z going along for the ride. No big deal. And uh, it's also uh, going to add to... Uh, you're going to add to that the uh, that telegrapher, right? Or I'm sorry, the uh, continuity equation. So effectively here, this is a pretty straightforward expression. And when I move that delta Z over to the other side and I divide by delta Z, you can see that this is easily just the, um, just the expression for um, my derivative, right? Because I'm taking a difference of my input variable uh, divided by um, 
that delta z where I've shifted this guy by delta z here. So you, you should be able to recognize the form for the derivative here. And these are all partial derivatives, by the way, because all of our all of our uh, v and i's are dependent on two variables, z and t. So these are all partial z, partial t derivatives, okay? So keep that in mind when you're doing this. It's, it's, it's a little important. Um, but anyways, when this simplifies out, we get that equation that I just showed you. And you can do the same thing from the current perspective where this also becomes a derivative. And the current one is a little bit easier to see here, uh, I think. Um, but, you know, you just use the same kind of uh, equivalencies that, that we showed from uh, before, and you're good to go. It's not a big deal. Okay. Clear as mud. <laughs> I know these look complicated, but um, it actually gets a lot worse. So we can combine these two equations now, right? And we can actually make something even more powerful. I mean, when you think about it, that's that'd be great. Oh, again? Okay. All right. All right. All right, well, f just get out of here, all right? I don't need all these Pokemon. Go back in your Pokeball. All right. Where are we going to even put him? I don't even know what to do with him. All right, so the telegrapher's equations evolved into the wave equation now. Well, how the heck did... What even ha Charizard, how did this even happen? All right, well, let's do a little Scooby-Doo in here and figure this out. So, let me get this crap out of here. Who even made these slides? These are ridiculous. Okay, I'm just going to do the derivation for the lossless version here, and then you can kind of see where this, uh, these other parts would come from. Um, if R and G here were equal to zero, right, then we have a lossless system, and this becomes rather trivial. Um, it gets us these guys down here. So let's go ahead and assume that the system is lossless and, and kind of work from there. So in that case, what we end up with is... Um, if I take the second spatial derivative, let me write it this way first. Oops. D, go away. All right. If I do that, we know that that was equal to, what did we have back here for the lossless one? Right here, this guy. Okay. So that was equal to minus L D D T of I uh, oh, it's actually this one for the lossless, sorry, uh, of I, Z, T. Minus L, D, D, T of I, Z, T. And we can actually do a little bit of, a, of an exchange here uh, to be able to find what this is going to be equal to. This is D, D, T, or D squared, D, Z squared, V, Z, T. And this, as it turns out, is equal to the double time derivative of, oops, let me, write it, let me push those constants out. It's actually equal to uh, LC times the double uh, time derivative of VZT. And that's just by using the simple replacement here uh, with respect to the derivative for uh, IZT, okay? And the minus sign crops out because of that as well. Um, if you really want to get, you know, picky with it, um, and actually see how this is behaving, let me do that real quick. I'll do this derivation justice. All right. So, okay. So I'm going to grab this guy here, All right? And I'm going to do a substitution in here. Boop. And this guy is going to, I'm going to switch the integral here or the, uh, differential sorry, switch the derivative order around, and I'm going to do dt, dt second to dz of i, z, t. Okay, and then I do the substitution, pop that in here. And what do I end up with? I end up with um, minus L, let's write this out, d, dt of minus c, d, d, t, v, z, t. And then you get this down here. So there we go. That's a little less lazy. And you can see how this would work for um, this other case as well, uh, deriving it from, of course, uh, these guys here and here. 
So, no big deal. And you would end up combining these two equations a little bit in order to get that uh, full expression here, noting that G and R uh, get kind of smooshed together. So these two would have to, you, you have to interact these two equations in some way to get those forms. Okay? No surprise, but yeah. All right, so that's how you do the derivation for the lossless system. Uh, if you want to, it's, it's an exercise. <laughs> It's become popular these days. Um, I'm not going to ask you to do anything like this on a quiz. This is just for, you know, your own edification at this point. Okay. Now for something completely different. Um, propagation velocity in the ideal wave equation. So we've already got, you know, our, our wave equation here, which, by the way, the, the general form for the wave equation um, is just you're taking the second derivative with respect to space is equal to the second derivative with respect to time of something. And you can modify different bits and pieces of this. But if you start to look at things like quantum mechanics, um, that's pretty much the basis of what you're dealing with, is looking at things from a waveform perspective um, and then kind of going from there. So if you ever dig into physics, that's where you're going to go. Um, but anyways, let's talk about this propagation velocity and this ideal version of the wave equation. So the general solution to the wave equation... It's some kind of sinusoid, okay? It's always some kind of sinusoid because for waves, we know they behave like this. Now, most of the time when you first learned about waves, the first thing you saw was actually, hey, this is a wave, and you go to the beach, and you see waves, they look like this. Um, but from a math perspective, what actually is occurring here is something quite different. What we see first coming at it mathematically is we see, oh, hey, I have a relationship that relates... The, the second spatial uh, derivative to the second time derivative. And the only equations that really meet that are equations that look like this. And equations that look like this happen to have this shape. So your whole perspective on things is, quite frankly, uh, a little backwards, right? We actually don't know that this is what a quote-unquote wave is until we define a wave equation. So, again... Everything you've been told is sort of a lie. Um, <laughs> but actually, in this case, it's it's not so much a lie. It was just an ideal little, little version here that's uh, convenient for us. But that'll work. Okay, so the... Wait a minute. I thought this was the wave equation, wasn't it? This is kind of the ideal wave equation here. We got a thing. And you could do a, do a frequency or do a shift in here, a phase shift. So what the heck is this... KZ thing? Is that some kind of phase shift term? Well, actually, this is something special. This is what's called a wave number. And it is kind of a, a shift, but really what it's better representing here is um, not that at all. <laughs> it's actually what's called a, a spatial frequency, too, in a way. Um, because it's attached to, it's a coefficient of our space dimension. Just as our regular old frequency is a coefficient of our time dimension. And as you may guess, um, because of this property, you actually can apply things like the Laplace or Fourier transform to spatial phenomena as well, because the number systems actually behave kind of similarly to each other. Now, the phase of these different things um, your spatial phase or your, your time phase are going to be, um, of course, still kind of special. Um, but this really isn't a, a phase at all. It's actually more of a frequency type of deal. But from the perspective of time, you might think of it as a phase shift. But from the perspective of space, you might think of frequency as a phase shift. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this. Uh, more than one way it's going to cat. So... Let's consider a couple different, um, oops, a couple different things here first, which is number one, what is C? Well, C is the speed of light, right? And that's our lambda times our frequency, our wavelength times our frequency. This is equal to F over one over lambda, another way to write this. And we have a lot of equivalencies that are written here in the book for us, but um, I'll just write out this series of expressions. But we can express K 
as this 2 pi over lambda here, and that's where we get this from. Okay? So as it turns out, something cool actually happens here. So in our coax cable, we end up with this kind of equation. Where is this even coming from? Well, if we think about the velocity um, of a wave, C, it's, it's presumably the speed of light, or close enough, then we end up with it being equal to 1 over the square root of LC. This should come as no surprise from some of the definitions that we've seen so far. Um, but one of the interesting facets of this is that uh, we already know how the speed of light is defined, or the speed of propagation, the propagation velocity, is defined. It's defined by the permeability, both magnetically and electrically. Or you could put these two together and call it the electromagnetic permeability if you want to. But these are universal constants, and when we have different media or different things like that or different fields affecting things, um, these will change and, and change our, our propagation a little bit and affect it in, in weird ways. But for all intents and purposes, our, uh, in a coax cable, we're going to use this kind of model for this. Okay. Now, if we want to simplify this, um, because we have this relationship here, Okay, so we do a little bit of algebra here. We end up with uh, k is equal to omega square root of LC. So this is a frequency divided by a speed. Okay. So if we want to simplify our expression for the voltage here with respect to unit distance, we can actually do it by using our frequency in here and then these little constants for our velocity, which becomes rather convenient. If this velocity of the wave is not constant, or is affected by something, or has its own little properties, you're gonna have to be careful. And it can get really complicated depending on the way that it's set up, which is why we like the coax example because it's simple in part. It also does some nice things for us. Okay, but anyways, by looking at a second partial derivative here, we actually can get some interesting equations. So if I take the second partial derivative of this expression, of this expression, I end up with, um, the following, I get I get this guy here. And if I take the second partial derivative with respect to time, I get a similar expression, but it doesn't have that uh, LC factor out front that came from the time part, right, from that Z. So this is consistent with our wave equation. Why is that? Well, because if I look at the relationship between these two, um, they are equal to each other, and they more importantly, are just proportionate to each other by a constant proportion of LC. Recall that our equation was LC d dt of that same V, okay? So these two are, in fact, um, proportionate to each other, and this equation, this, this solution, okay, is consistent. For our equation. So um, basically, we're good to go using this, this version right here, okay, for the for our calculations and for our purposes moving forward. So knowing that, now we can ask the big questions. How are our voltage and current related to each other? And the best way to describe this is using impedance once again. And we're going to use the characteristic impedance, but not for an electronic circuit or a little element or anything like that, but for the entire line or for a segment of the line. So this becomes very interesting because now what I can do is I can say, okay, let's look back here and say uh, we know our telegrapher's equation, equations rather. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug in to the second one that solution that we have to the wave equation. So we know what, um, what the form of V should look like if it was to be consistent. And when we plug this in, we get something very interesting. So we go ahead and plug this in and we have to take its time derivative and then multiply it by negative one over L. Okay, easy enough. Done, right here. We simplify this, we end up with this expression here. Okay, well that's nice. Um, I can simplify a little bit further, get this guy, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I still have 
this integral, or I'm sorry, this uh, derivative with respect to time, how am I going to get rid of that? Uh, to be able to relate my current here to my expression for voltage, I had a solution for voltage. It was very nice. I, I just arbitrarily said, hey, it's a sine function. Let's go. Let's dance. But I know that my current is dependent on my voltage to a certain extent, right? There's a very strong relationship between the two. And so that's why I'm doing all of this. All right, so now if I can isolate, if I can just isolate this IZT, I can say, okay, here's what I have for I, here's what I have for V, and then take their ratio. And that's what we use the integral for. So integrate with respect to time, we end up with this integral over here. We know what the integral of a cosine function is with respect to time. It's just going to be a sine function. It's very easy. And uh, all the other constants kind of fall out of there uh, and cancel out. And we end up with this expression. Now, this should look pretty familiar because it looks darn near the same as what we had for this guy, with the exception of this factor right, oops, this factor right here. Okay, so when I take their ratio, and I say, okay, here was my, how I defined my solution originally. Here's what I found using uh, telegrapher's equations. I calculate an impedance, right? I calculate an impedance, and this is just for that segment, right? This is just for that segment that one individual segment right here. And in this case, we're just looking at that, um, at that simple case. And we have uh, the ratio of these two and they divide out and we end up with just left over L over C and, and the square root of that. And this is just for the lossless case, okay? It gets more complicated for the the lossy case. So uh, if you want, you can calculate Z naught for lossy case. And that's pretty much what um, the entire uh, 38.5 is in your textbook. Um, I would encourage you to actually read it before kind of trying to attempt uh, even dealing with that problem if you like. But it is there if you want to try to do it. Um, but none of this is going to be covered on your final, okay? So it'll just be for exploratory purposes. But the lossless case is good enough for us to start our discussion on this, okay? And that's going to pretty much wrap us up for today. Um, I know this lecture is also probably pretty short. I hope it is because this isn't going to be heavily emphasized and you guys should have more time to work on other things. So go forth, go work on some other things and study for... Uh, your quizzes or whatever else you got to do. All right, we'll see you later. Last lecture coming up here, lecture 37. Good luck.